Okay, just tell me when. Uh, I think we can start now if you are ready. Yeah, okay, sure. Okay, great. Oh. Uh, okay. okay, everyone. So let's start uh, the seminar now. Uh, today is our great honor to have Professor David Xi uh, as our speaker for the seminar series on HTC Superconnector. Uh, David is now a professor at Caltech. He is an experimentalist who is using optical method to study condensed systems uh, with a focus on topological phases and uh, correlated systems. Uh, today he will tell us the recent discovery of anomalous symmetry breaking order in Kubrit. So let's welcome David. David, please. Okay, Yahui and uh, Jubin, thanks a lot for the invitation. It's, it's an honor to be here. And also, um, you know, congratulations on putting together this really nice seminar series. I've been, I've been feeling like a student again, um, learning every week. Um, so today, I thought I'd share some recent, um, some recent and not so recent results on the cuprates uh, with regards to second harmonic generation experiments. And before I delve into the results, I did want to spend a little bit of time, given the sort of flexibility of the schedule to uh, explain a few fundamental things about optical second harmonic generation, particularly as it applies to um, as applies to being a probe of magnetism. I think elucidating some of these, these basics uh, will help you to digest and interpret some of our results a little better. So I'll start off with that introduction. Um, and then I'll talk a bit about um, some SHG results on YBCO that we acquired a few years ago. Uh, and then I'll finish with some discussions of, of very new data on these um, copy, copper oxychlorides. And I, I do invite you to interrupt me at any point in the talk if anything's unclear. Let me just start off acknowledging the people that um, you know, made this project possible and did the work. Um, the work on YBCO was um, primarily carried out by my former postdoc, Huyen Zhao, who's now an assistant professor at Michigan, uh, with a very talented summer student, Karina Belvin, who's now a graduate student at MIT. Um, we've also had, um, you know, important input from, from Peter Armitage as far as uh, data interpretation, and our samples came from the UBC group. And for the more recent results on the copper oxychloride, um, these projects were led by um, my former postdoc, Alberto De La Torre, who's now at Brown University. Um, and uh, some this project's being continued by my, form, by my current postdoc, Kyle Seiler. Uh, the samples, um, many, many samples we've gone through were, were um, grown by the Grevin Group at Minnesota. And um, a lot of this uh, interpretation is really thanks to uh, this uh, group of theorists that we had the pleasure to collaborate with Sergio, Mike, uh, Matias, and Subir. And these are the funding agents. Okay, so let me start with giving you an overview of SHG's approved magnetism. And I'll start very basically uh, just by um, explaining, um, you know, the types of term that we're interested in. So um, if you take a multiple expansion uh, of the source term to, to, to Maxwell's equations, okay, um, then you can have a leading order electric dipole response uh, followed by high order magnetic dipole and electric quadrupole responses and so forth. Okay. And so these are the multipoles that are oscillating in material that give rise to the radiation. Now these um, oscillating multipoles, um, you know, of course are, are generated by some um, external light field that's impinging on the sample. Uh, that light field carries some electric and magnetic fields uh, at frequency omega. And most of the responses that uh, we're probably uh, used to uh, in terms of studying materials are these linear responses, uh, which are first order in nature, uh, that couple uh, you know single power of the, an incident field, either electric or magnetic, with some induced uh, polarization density. Now, uh, the response that we're interested in um, in my group are those that occur at second order or higher, okay, where um, the process involves uh, two incident fields, either an electric electric or an electric magnetic uh, or magnetic magnetic. Um, 
uh, and uh, how they influence the induced um, polarization in the material. And these responses are governed by tensors that are higher rank. So they have one more index than the linear response. And that higher index, uh, higher rank turns out to uh, encode um, you know, more degrees of freedom that provide you sometimes more information than what you can uh, extract from linear response. Okay. Now, the downside is, of course, that you know, there are all these, um, you know, this zoo of responses now you have to disentangle. Okay. And I think in many ways, that's the price we have to pay when it comes to going to second order responses. So I'll show you some examples of how this disentanglement occurs. As I mentioned, um, you know, the fact that you're dealing with these higher rank tensors really gives you some, high, you know, uh, really encodes more degrees of freedom that give you sometimes more information about the symmetry properties of the crystal. Okay, so by Neumann's principle, we know that any tensor response uh, that describes a physical property of crystal uh, let's take this one for example. Uh, if you constrain that response to the symmetries of the crystal, um, then what you get on the output is some simpler um, tensor structure that you know embeds the symmetries of the crystal. Okay, so in principle, uh, if you know these tensor structures, you can say something about the point group symmetries of the crystal. Um, the downs, you know, the downside of lower rank tensors is that um, you know, there's often a lot of degeneracy between different uh, crystals, classes. And so, for example, if you were to look at, um, you know, this, this linear chi-1 response in different crystal uh, classes, like, you know, these three, for example, um, there are really only two independent elements, XX and ZZ, um, and they, they all look the same, despite the fact that you're in different crystal classes. And that um, imp um, sort of, you know, it, it impedes the ability to, perform careful refinement between crystal families. Uh, on the other hand, if you start to go to higher rank, uh, add one more index in this case, then not only do you gain the ability to distinguish between different crystal families, but also uh, different point group symmetries within a single crystal class. So, so here I'm showing, for example, um, uh, different uh, point groups in the uh, tetragonal uh, crystal class. And you can see that for these different point groups, um, these are the number of uh, independent elements, okay? And, um, you know, the, the tensor structure basically looks different for those different point groups. And so if you had a way to map out these tensor structures very carefully, you could, you could do some um, at least point group symmetry refinement. Okay, so the particular um, nonlinear response we're looking at today, as I mentioned, is second harmonic generation. And basically that's the... Um, you know, that's the emission of light at twice the frequency as your incoming beam of light. Okay. So I already mentioned in linear response, when you measure omega in, omega out responses, you, you're primarily governed by this um, electric dipole, um, second rank tensor. For SHG, um, you know, you have to worry about a few more terms. So uh, predominantly, um, you're sort of dominated by this electric dipole response again, which includes two electric fields coming in, um, inducing a polarization uh, in the material oscillating at twice the instant frequency, at two omega, okay? Um, however, it turns out that having a bulk response in the electric dipole channel is not uh, universal. In particular, if your system uh, has inversion symmetry, if your crystal has a center of inversion, um, then this electric dipole leading response is identically zero by symmetry. Okay. So um, then you have to really start to consider um, sort of higher, you know, higher order terms. Uh, one of which is a surface electric dipole uh, term. Since the surface breaks inversion symmetry, you can have a non-zero chi ed at the surface, but that's you know because of uh, because you know there's much less volume there than the bulk. So typically that's that's a much weaker response than you'd get in a um, in a bulk inversion broken material. Um, and that surface response can often be of comparable intensity to um, higher rank bulk multiple, you know, higher multiple responses. So for example, if you, um, this e electric quadrupole response, which is a rank four polar tensor, that's allowed even in the bulk of inversion symmetric materials, um, that becomes sort of a dominant uh, response in centrosymmetric systems. Um, as does uh, a response like the magnetic dipole, which
which is now in, you're dealing with an axial third rank tensor, which which now is allowed even in the presence of inversion symmetry. So uh, the cr crystals I'll talk about today, uh, largely crystallographically are inversion symmetric. And so we'll have to contend with this competition between, um, you know, potentially surface uh, bulk electric quadrupole, bulk magnetic dipole terms, and so on. I want to say a few words about uh, the technique. Okay, um, so how do you how do you go about sampling this tensor structure of let's say an SHG tensor? And I'll talk about that before I go into the details of how we distinguish between the different processes. Um, so sort you know technically maybe the simplest way is just you know, come in, come in at normal incidence to a sample. Okay, so your K vector is parallel to the surface normal. And um, you can measure the intensity of the reflected second harmonic light as a function of, um, you know, your incident light polarization, outgoing light polarizations. Okay, now this is commonly employed and is technically straightforward. Um, however, you know, you can tell from the geometry that there are limitations to this technique, namely that you know there's no field component parallel to the z direction, right? They're all in plane, and so you fail to pick up a lot of tensor elements that involve uh, a z component. Okay, um, you could um, you could get around that by coming in at oblique incidence, thereby creating a z component of your field. Um, and one simple way to do that is just to adopt this oblique incident geometry. Uh, setup uh, where you're now rotating the um, electric fields of the instant and outgoing beams as a means of sampling different tensor elements. Okay. Um, however, there's also uh, you know so there's there's also a limitation to this sort of configuration um, in that you know you're not rotating the scattering plane relative to the sample, so the beams and the sample are all stationary in this case, and um, there's also, you know, a, a limited number of, a more than a limited number of tensor elements you can sample this way. And moreover, um, you know, if you want to look at, you know, the rotational symmetries of the crystal, let's say about the c-axis, um, you can you can sort of intuit to yourself that to do that you'd really want to rotate the crystal, right? Here, um, any rotational symmetry that you get from simply rotating the polarization is going to have the symmetries of the of the optic itself, not not the crystal. Um, and so really the, um, I think the more exhaustive but more complicated setup is one where you uh, perform what, you call, what we call a rotational anisotropy measurement where you're rotating, you're coming in with oblique incidence but you're also rotating the scattering plane relative to the sample normal, okay? About the sample normal. And so if you, if you adopt this geometry and you um, um, acquire, um, SHG intensities is a function of this angle phi about which your scattering plane rotates about the surface normal, and you do these experiments with different ingoing and outgoing polarizations. That's a pretty, you know, uh, comprehend. That's a pretty exhaustive way of mapping out this tensor structure. Okay, being sensitive to all the tensors in your in your response. So the challenge with doing this RA so-called RA type measurement is that there are a lot of moving parts, as you can see from the setup. Okay, so, um, you know, if you do it on a, a super flat uh, ideal material, uh, sometimes those uh, non idealities in the experiment are not as uh, not as serious, uh, but it does become dangerous when you have, you know, when we're, we're working with uh, these small samples that are oftentimes non uniform and uh, riddled with terraces and cracks that you want to avoid. Um, because anytime you, uh, um, you, 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 you veer from um, sort of the ideal geometry, you can get artifacts in your measurement. Okay, so there are all these moving parts in the in the in the experiment. You have to, um, you know, avoid beams walking around the sample, going to to bad spots. You have to avoid um, any precession of the reflected beam, right? So you you know you want to keep this angle of incidence, okay, an angle of reflection constant as you rotate phi, okay, because it turns out the SHG intensity is also very sensitive to the, you know, to this angle, to this angle of incidence. And so if you have any precession in your um, reflected beam as you're rotating the scattering plane, you're also gonna get artifacts that obscure the true symmetries, okay? Um, and as I mentioned before, if you're dealing with, you know, uh, small 
crystals, which is you typically see in you know these correlated materials, you've got to have um, you've got to have that that degree of control. Uh, more, you know, I think uh, moreover, um, you know, oftentimes we want to do things at low temperatures or extreme environments like high fields and high pressures, um, and it becomes very hard if you you know in those environments to rotate your your crystal, right? If you embed your system in, for example, a diamond anvil cell for high pressures, it's very challenging to have to rotate that that cell mechanically. Okay, and so um, we developed uh, a few years ago, um, a few generations of a setup that enable you to keep the sample stationary, okay, um, so that you can accommodate sort of these extreme environments and just rotate the scattering plane externally, but do that in a very precise way, okay? And so I won't go through all the elements of the setup, but essentially, um, you know, you have your beam coming in, uh, oblique, reflected uh, beam coming out at the second harmonic. Um, all of that gets projected onto a 2D detector. And as we mechanically spin the scattering plane, which is going at several Hertz in the lab, um, those different scattering plane angles are projected onto different positions on this detector. And so we end up acquiring um, images for our RA patterns, okay? Yeah, so just a few characteristics on the performance of the setup. Um, Again, I won't go through all these details. Here's a picture of um, two beams just coming in um, to the sample, forming an optical grating as a demonstration of um, sort of how well our beams, uh, how well our alignment can be can be done. Uh, and here you see that um, you know uh, there's a very little uh, beam walking. Okay, you, we can quantify that by purposely find, looking for a defect and then quantifying how much we walk as we rotate the scattering plane. Uh, the walk is, is pretty good. It's, it's you know, limited to about a micron or so. Um, and moreover, uh, with this sort of grading um, type technique, you can quantify how much your angle of incidence is walking as you rotate your scattering plane just by comparing the K vector of this grading at various scattering plane angles. Um, so here I'm projecting that K vector at, at select points along my uh, phi axis. And um, again, the precession of our scattering plane is pretty good. It's, it's limited to less than about um, the 20th of a degree. So all these um, improvements to the setup enable us to take sort of, um, you know, I think what I think are pretty good RA SHG data on challenging samples in extreme environments. So as I mentioned, the, data, the types of data I'll be showing are um, look, like, look like images like this. Okay, and so the intensity, this is the second harmonic reflection and going around the circle is, is different scattering plane angles. And so here is uh, data from gallium arsenide, which is a nice sample to work with. And you can see that uh, for gallium arsenide, which breaks in burgeoning, we have a strong electric dipole SHG allowed in the bulk. Uh, you get these patterns within seconds uh, that already sort of manifest the uh, symmetries of the underlying material. And to quantitatively analyze these, these data, uh, what we do is, you know, we just we just radially integrate between these dashed lines where the data is non-zero, and form these polar plots. Okay, uh, the the radial direction here is the intensity versus the scattering plane angle, and you know you can you know just like one one perhaps would do in diffraction studies, um, you can sort of reduce your chi tensor under various point group symmetries, and um, and go ahead and fit your data. So we take a bunch of the these types of data under different polarization geometries, for example, and we do a universal fit to chi, and the best fits are how we determine the appropriate point group symmetry of the material. Okay. So, um, just over the you know um, over the past uh, year or two, we've been trying to you know sort of uh, work towards this promise of being able to do these things under, under extreme environments. We've recently realized the ability to, to take uh, data under high pressures. We have a diamond anvil cell uh, that can go up to you know, 30, 30 GPA or so, and we're able to take now these rotational anisotropy patterns under high pressures. Here's an example um, of a structural phase transition occurring as a function of pressure in a, in a wild semi-metal. And this is done uh, in collaboration with Tom Rosenbaum's group at Caltech, who offers a lot of high pressure expertise. Um, and then, uh, you know, we've also uh, more recently um, acquired the ability to do these experiments in, a, in an in-plane rotating field 
and I'll show you a few more results using this technique uh, led by my postdoc, Kyle Seiler. Okay, okay so um, now that I've gone through a bit of the technical aspect, I want to show you... Um, One question, I, David. Yeah, please. One. Hi, Chandra. Uh, hi, David. Uh, in, in relation to these anisotropy patterns, uh, what is the beam diameter of your the best smallest beam diameter that you work with? Yeah. So, um, the, if if we it depends on um, you know what we're what what we prioritize. But if we just want small sizes, we can go to close to the diffraction limit, which would be you know on the order of a micron. The, um, that's you, the best. Uh, that's that's the best. Yeah. We're we're all we're always above okay. diffraction limit. Okay. Um, but what's typical, um, you know, when we get that small, we actually have issues with um, sample damage because it's so intense. And so typically we back back off a little bit uh, and we stay at, you know, in, the, in a few tens of microns range. So when you see these anisotropies, you, you have to worry a bit about uh, domains and stuff in the analysis within we do. the beam. We do, within the, within the beam spot, if it, you know, if they're smaller than you know, ten, tens of microns, then certainly that becomes an, an issue we have to contend with in the analysis. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so I want to say a few things about um, now, um, you know, I told you there are all these different processes that one needs to think about, you know, so what are some of the ways to, what are some of the signatures of these different processes and what are the ways um, to, to, to sort of maybe disentangle them? Okay, so the first, um, the first uh, um, category of process I want to deal with is surface magnetization. Okay, I mentioned already the SHG is very surface sensitive, okay, and um, that can be both a blessing and a curse. Pardon me. Um, so, if you have a material, for example, that preserves inversion symmetry crystallographically, and becomes um, let's say acquires a surface magnetization below some critical temperature given by this dashed line, then, you know, generically what you might see is um, that above TC, okay, with TC being, let's say, a Curie temperature, there's some um, um, higher order response, maybe, a, maybe, the electric, uh, di maybe an electric dipole surface response, okay, that comes from the crystallographic structure. And that response is I-type. I-type just means that this tensor chi ED is invariant under time reversal symmetry, under time reversal operation. And then as you cool down below this uh, magnetic ordering temperature, you get a new response that turns on uh, corresponding to um, and a C-type surface ED contribution, where C-type just means that um, your, your tensor is now, uh, um, it goes from change of sign under time reversal, okay? So typically these responses are proportional to a surface magnetization. So if M flips, um, the chi, the sign of chi flips. And this crystallographic term is always there. And so when you cool below TC, you get some, uh, you know, constructive interference between uh, this response and this response. And that's borne out in the intensities that you measure. Okay. Um, you know, in, in bulk response, because they're not, you know, inherently surface sensitive, um, surface magnetization is typically very hard to pick up. So if you were to do a reflectivity measurement, uh, for example, you wouldn't see too much of a boost, okay? Because you're primarily bulk sensitive there. And I'll invite you to look at this review article, um, which really goes through the history and, and uh, details of, of such responses in excellent detail. Okay, so, but I, I wanna just use an ex a recent experiment from my group to, to illustrate what you might when expect from a uh, surface response. And so one of the compounds we've been working on, on a lot is, is strontium iridate, which is sort of this strongly spin orbit coupled cousin of lanthanum cuprate, uh, lanthanum 2 copper O4. And um, in this compound, you also have this two sublattice nail order, but there's a canting of the oxygen uh, uh, octahedra that results in a net magnetic moment per layer, okay? And so you can see that all this, this slight canting leads to a net moment given by this purple arrow. And the stacking of this purple arrow, this net moment along the C-axis is staggered in a left, left, right, right, left, left fashion, at least in zero magnetic field, okay? And so if you um, come in with, um, you know, if you were to do, for example, a, 
um, uh, an optical curve effect measurement. Uh, there, there's no net magnetization to couple to, but with uh, surface sensitive SHE, you can actually couple to the top layer um, and monitor that magnetization on the top layer. Okay, so here, for example, is um, just a white light image of a, of a flat cleaved strontium irradiated surface. This is wide field SHG imaging of that surface. And as you cool down below the nail temperature, you see this patchwork develop. Um, and this patchwork um, corresponds to different orientations, as I'll show in a slide, of this surface magnetization vector, okay, along each of the four directions of the tetragonal lattice. If you you know, park your beam, this goes back to Chandra's point here, we typically take a wide field image to identify features, and then we shrink our beam down to um, within, you know, within the area of at least a domain that we can resolve in, in wide field imaging, okay? Um, and we keep our beam there, let's say, you know, at the point where my laser pointer is, and you perform temperature dependent measurements, then at least what we find in this material is that at high temperatures above TNAL, um, we're dominated by a bulk electroquadrupole response of I type. Okay, and then as we cool down below TNAL, you see this huge uptick in second harmonic, but you know, no, no change in the linear response, which, is, which are these open black squares down here. Okay, and if you look at the RA pattern, it evolves um, from looking something fourfold, reflective of the underlying crystallographic symmetry, to something that uh, has only C1 symmetry about the C-axis, okay? And that corresponds to your surface magnetization now choosing a direction, okay? And that term, that's, uh, that, that you can, um, that, that's governed by this C-type electric dipole response. And of course, the interference of the two is what gives you this type of shape. You can scan around your sample and, and we identify, you know, four domains, which again are the four directions the magnetization vector can point along. And so you can do more sophisticated measurements to, um, to, to, to really convince yourself that it's coming from the surface. So here Kyle's, um, you know, combined some SHG imaging with um, atomic force microscopy experiments. Um, so here is, um, you know, here, here for example are four domains that we've identified via these RA patterns, where which direction the big lobe is pointing in. And if you go, for example, from region one to two, um, that corresponds, it turns out to a bilayer step in the AFM scan. And every time we encounter a bilayer step, we see that the spin uh, flips by 180. Okay, and so that's consistent with the stacking pattern in strontium iridate, this left, left, right, right. Okay, every time you go down two layers, the spin direction has to flip. Okay. Um, and um, moreover, uh, you can see that as we thermally cycle through TNAL several times, um, the spin in region one and spin region two are always anti-correlated, okay? If one is down, the other is up. So really, um, uh, you, can, you can look at the paper for details, but really there's this big region which we think we're really sensitive just to the surface magnetization. Okay. Um, there's also... Um, so, so surface magnetization is one way you can get a response in SHG. Another way is, uh, you know, maybe you have some, some bulk magnetic order that turns on, but it preserves inversion symmetry, okay? So in this scenario, you might have some I-type uh, response at high temperatures, let's say electroquadruple. And then as you go below uh, TC, you now have some uh, C-type bulk response turn on. Let's say, let's say a magnetic dipole SHG response that's uh, proportional to your bulk magnetization. Okay, so something like this can also turn on an SHG response. And again, there's a great review paper that I invite you to, to read through if you're interested. And so it turns out that this response is also possible to, uh, um, to realize in strontium iridate. If you slap on an in-plane magnetic field uh, above HC, which where HC is, is roughly a 0.2 Tesla, okay, then you actually change the, you actually undergo a, a metamagnetic transition from left, left, right, right to, you know, all right. Okay, and so the system now has a, has a net bulk magnetization. And that's borne out, for example, in, in uh, static uh, magneto-optical Kerr rotation experiments. Okay, you can see below TNAL, you have a Kerr signal that turns on. And in SHG, that leads to um, another process that we've identified as originating from the C-type magnetic dipole SHG channel. 
And you can see that um, in these curves, for example, like here at h equals zero, that's the curve I showed you earlier. Okay, you, you only have this surface magnetic dipole term. But once you start turning on a field, you get another term that's proportional to the magnetization. So here I'm showing, uh, you know, squid data. This is bulk magnetization versus temperature. You can see that, that this contribution now gets uh, superimposed on the surface contribution, right? So you have this sort of order parameter like upturn accompanied by this peak structure. And then as you go to, you know, much higher fields uh, where, you know, your sample is fully magnetized, uh, then you get dominated by the bulk magnetic dipole term. Okay. And so you, you, you then perfectly mimic the bulk magnetization data. Okay. So all that is to say that, you know, these things do get disentangled, uh, do get entangled in your uh, SHG response and you have to sort of take care to separate them out, but, but there are ways. Um, the perhaps uh, um, one of the more um, uh, striking examples uh, of what can happen is if your sample uh, breaks inversion symmetry due to magnetic ordering. Okay, so here, for example, yeah, you might again start at high temperatures with some higher multipole bulk response of I type, but if your magnetic order breaks the inversion symmetry of the underlying crystallographic structure, um, then you can have a C type uh, electric dipole uh, radiation term turn on, which usually is very, very strong, okay? And um, that starts to sort of dominate your signal. Okay, and again, these are not so easily borne out in linear optics measurements. Uh, so, you know, uh, an example we've recently looked at are these, um, these, these Van der Waals magnets of ABX3 structure. Okay, so um, I, I talk about this just to illustrate sort of, um, illustrate this point experimentally. So here, for example, well, you know, I'm looking at three materials, uh, manganese, iron, and nickel, phosphor sulfide. And the structure of these materials is, is, uh, is the same, um, but the magnetic orders are different, okay? In particular, manganese uh, phosphor sulfide breaks inversion symmetry by virtue of its, the nail ordering of its spins, whereas the iron and nickel uh, analogs have this sort of zig, so-called zigzag antiferromagnetic structure that preserves inversion symmetry. And so if you do SHG on all of these, what you find is that um, in, the, in the nickel and iron cases, there's really no feature across the magnetic ordering transition, uh, whereas there's this huge jump in manganese, uh, in the manganese version, right? That's um, exactly emblematic of the fact that it breaks inversion, okay? Um, and lastly, okay, so, so I've gone through a few ways in which magnetic ordering can lead to changes in SHG intensity. Um, but one needs to be careful too. If you just, if you see upturns in SHG, that doesn't always uh, mean that uh, you're actually seeing long range magnetic ordering, okay? So in fact, uh, we've done some uh, recent experiments to show that um, even if you, um, even if you start developing magnetic correlations, that's enough to change your SHG intensity. And I wanna just spend two slides uh, going through this example. So here, you know, you could be above a magnetic ordering transition, for example, okay? Um, where your response is dominated by these I-type tensors. But if you have magnetic correlations turn on in this temperature window, uh, you can have an interesting temperature dependence of your I-type tensor, okay? That, that's, that still could be um, uh, somewhat dramatic. So one example, again, I'll go back to these ABX3 compounds, um, are ferromagnetic correlations, okay? So uh, in this, in this quasi-2D material, um, you know, TC is something like 30 Kelvin, uh, but it's quasi 2D. So you get these 2D uh, in-plane correlations that build up far above the Curie temperature of the material, okay? And, and basically what happens is, is this. So um, the energy density of the material, you can think of as split up in two parts. There's an, there's an elastic energy, which of course depends on all the coordinates of your atoms, but there's also a magnetic part, okay? And that magnetic part also depends on, you know, the atomic configuration. Uh, namely, uh, because your magnetic energy density, um, at least if it's described by the sort of Heisenberg um, uh, Hamiltonian, you know, has some exchange interaction that mediates coupling between neighboring spins, right? And so you can think of um, the scenario where if my spin correlator becomes non-zero, so I haven't ordered yet, but I, I start developing correlations between neighbors. So the thermal expectation of SI dot SJ becomes non-zero. Then this term becomes operative. And um, 
the system, you know, the, 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 for example, the bond angles can slightly rearrange in order to, you know, minimize the energy of this term, right? So your J exchange, your, 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 in other words, your atomic coordinates will respond in such a way as to, um, you know, minimize the total energy um, at the expense of maybe some gaining elastic energy if you, if you, if you lose more in the magnetic channel. Um, and so you can see, you can actually pick that up in SHG. So here I'm, I'm unfolding the RA patterns. Now I'm plotting this in, in the linear, uh, on a linear axis. Um, so here I've got my scattering plane angle phi and here are the different temperatures, all right? So TC in this material is here around 30 Kelvin. Okay, something dramatic happens below TC, but even up here in um, the temperature, in the temperature window where, you know, ostensibly nothing's going on, um, if you take these RA patterns, uh, they look, they, you, ac you can actually see that they're evolving with temperature, okay? Uh, these are all, it turns out, electric quadrupole responses, which are really weak, so there's a bit of noise on our data, um, but the changes are, um, you know, the changes are, are clear. And you can then do what I mentioned earlier, which is fit, um, you know, you can fit to the tensor uh, for, for this electric quadrupole process at all temperatures and extract the values of the various tensor elements, let's say chi x, 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 z, for example, as a function of temperature. Okay, and what you find is that, um, th this is the data. What, you, what we found in this particular compound is that there are two sets of tensors, uh, x, 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 z, and y, y, z, that sort of have this sort of, you know, um, have this temperature dependence above Tc, okay? And um, we've done sort of a, um, you know, a classical, uh, calculation of the intralayer spin correlator using the experimental parameters, and that's overlaid here in brown. Okay, and so we think that there again, um, you can look at the paper for details, but um, there are ways in which we can um, we can reason that um, it's these two elements uh, that are sensitive to the in-plane spin-spin correlator, and similarly, there's another element that we think sort of scales with the out-of-plane spin-spin correlator. Okay, which have different temperature dependencies. The 2D correlations build up and then, and then above some critical uh, correlation length, the, the C-axis orders. Okay, so um, all that is to say, I'll, I'll just flash one more example. That was in a ferromagnet, but even in systems which do not order, like, like Herbert Smithite, which is a um, candidate for a quantum spin liquid, uh, you know, we see similar behavior where, you know, across um, the, uh, um, the scale of the exchange, um, you do see some sort of, you know, onset in your SHG intensity. So that here, we've plotted the SHG here um, in yellow, sort of on top of, um, again, a, a, a calculated uh, spin-spin correlator. So all that is to say that, you know, when you look at, um, you know, SH, when you, when you look at our SHG results that I'm about to show you now, um, you know, uh, the, this is sort of the critical eye you need to, you need to adopt when you when you start to interpret the data. Okay, so I'm going to delve into cuprate data now. Um, are there any questions just about the, you know, the basics of SHG or anything I've said so far? From from these uh, experiments, can you uh, get a correlation length when you have short range order? Um, or you can only speak qualitative. No about what's happening yeah we can we can go we can go as quantitative so maybe i'll say another word about this experiment we can go as quantitative as saying we know you know since there's no symmetry broken what we do is we look at all the um, totally symmetric distortions of the crystal and how those distortions might affect the various tensor elements in your response okay so we can go as quantitative as to say that um you know, uh, this, the, 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 you know, these tensors turning on corresponds to this type of totally symmetric distortion, this A1G mode or something. Okay. Um, but correlation lengths, uh, I would say are, are currently beyond the, our capability. And in, in relation to the next experiment you showed, uh, the, on, on Herbert Smith height, um, uh, supposing there was some, uh, more uh, interesting correlation, SI dot SJ times SK dot SL 
times SL dot FI, you know, some kind of ring order, would you, uh, that, that, would, that would have some, some uh, response in your second harmonic experiments. Are there, have you thought of ways you might separate uh, um, simply, uh, you know, the, the simplest from something more interesting like that? Yeah, I think we, we've, we've thought about that uh, from a very cursory um, standpoint. And I, I think it's tricky. I mean, we, you know, we could, you know, start splitting hairs by sort of calculating uh, these various correlators and then comparing those to our data. But, uh, you know, no, our data... Let's not, let's not trust any calculation. What I'm saying is that so something like Herbert Smith height, it, it's uh, perhaps more likely that it is some uh, m more uh, obtuse thing happening than a short range correlation of SI dot SC. Right. There, there could be, we haven't thought about this uh, too carefully, but there could be some, you'd have to, you know, um, you, you, at the end of the day, this is all magneto -el elastic coupling that enables what um, enables our measurements. So I think if you, if you were to, you know, if there were some ideas about how these different correlators well, you know, through immediately that's the coupling, what effects those have on various distortion in the crystal, we might be able to say something. But do, you, do you always monitor the, uh, the, the intensity of the second harmonic against the intensity of the input beams to see if uh, it's simply going quadratically or uh, some other powers? Yeah, that's really important. We, if, we're, if we're claiming second harmonic, then we always check that. Um, you know, it's quadratic dependence. And yeah, we make sure, you know, at higher power, sometimes it deviates, so we have to make sure we're staying in the right, in the ideal regime. Okay. May I ask a more technical question? Yeah, uh, how, how what power do you provide and how reliable is your temperature reading? Because there are big powers involved. Yeah, so you're talking about optical power, right? Yeah. Yeah, we so we um, uh, our setup is actually a, it's it's done with a pulse laser just to leverage the strong electric fields, and to give you you know it differs a bit by experiment and what each each material can can handle, um, but we um, you know, typically are using uh, just be below maybe a milliwatt average power, which corresponds to a fluence of maybe I don't know just under a millijoule per centimeter squared, something in that range. Um, we, you know, we try to ensure that there's no, you know, um, at least pronounced average heating happening, just just because mostly we're looking at, um, but both we can do that both from calculation, uh, but also, we, you know, we, we look at some established phase transitions and we, we can see that that's not drifting too much from reported values. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes. So, uh, can I ask the question? Yeah. So, yeah. So, does the system remain in the normal skin effect regime? Because at lower temperature, uh, 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 because this uh, the mean three path will increase, and uh, so it may go into the anomalous skin effect regime. So, so uh, how do you make sure that uh, it is in the normal skin effect regime? Uh, because then, if there is anomalous skin effect regime, then the no non-local effects <laughs> one has to take into account. So can you comment on that? Um, sorry, the sound wasn't so clear, but I think you're asking about, um, so, you know, for example, in this experiment, uh, you know, we, we, are, we are looking at a non-local response. This is a, this is all, maybe I should have mentioned, this is all the electric quadruple. So it's a sort of E, you know, E grad so, E type of local response. Okay. Because there is, a, there is some penetration depth of the electric field. So let us say this length scale, how this length scale compares with the, with the with with the length scale scattering length scale, so what I mean to say that whether the system remains in the normal skin effect regime all the time or temperature. Oh, you're asking. Okay, so with regards to penetration depths, um, yeah. So these you know these these experiments are all done at a constant angle of instance, and they're they're not they're not so um, you know. They're not so large. In fact, they're not. They're not nothing near grazing. Um, this is all done at roughly ten degree off normal, which is enough to pick up these 
these Z components. Okay, okay, maybe I'm not able to make it clear. So, uh, because this is the reflectivity which is measured. Uh, so, the, my question so uh, was related to whether it, the system always in the normal skin effect or or because low temperatures, uh, uh, the 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 mean free path can be greater than the penetration depth of the electric field. So then the non-local effects uh, be uh, become important. So so maybe uh, I don't know what is going on, but uh, this is just a comment. Yeah, no, that that, that um, it's interesting. Maybe maybe we can come back to this at the end. Um, I I might have some backup slides on that. Sure, 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 sure. Um, Okay, thank, but thanks for all the questions. So let, let, let's go on to um, the cuprates now. So um, uh, I don't have to introduce this phase diagram to, to this audience, <clears throat> but I will just say that, you know, um, in YBCO at least, we were, we were very much interested in um, the transition occurring uh, across this sort of uh, strange metal regime to the pseudo gap regime marked by T star, okay? Um, so in YBCO, uh, you know, at, um, at, at Y equals six, um, it's uh, in the parent phase, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's mod insulator and then tetragonal. And as you start um, hull doping um, via changes on the oxygen site, um, those, those sort of go into this uh, copper oxygen chain. Okay, and so that makes the system more thrombic um, and crystallographically that's been resolved. And um, across, um, you know, ac across this doping range, it's been shown by various measurements already that um, um, signatures of some sort of symmetry breaking are taking place. So I'll just list, um, you know, I'll, I'll list a few here. Uh, first of all, crystallographically, we know that um, the material is orthrhombic uh, with uh, the centrosymmetric MMM crystallographic point group. And there, there, there's, there's various evidence um, for symmetry breaking across T star, um, including some seminal work um, from, from polarized neutron scattering, um, showing both uh, time reversal breaking, uh, as well as um, um, evidence of inversion, of, of, of inversion breaking across T star. Okay, um, there's been some uh, uh, Nernst effects measurements that have been um, used to argue for a sort of a pneumatic phase, a C4 to C2, symmetry breaking that fall along a similar line. Uh, there are uh, terahertz polarimetry measurements um, that have shown that, um, you know, these vertical mirror planes are actually, uh, are actually broken and they get enhanced across T star. Um, and then there's evidence from resin ultrasound experiments um, showing that, you know, there, there's some evidence for, for a, um, for, for sort of changes in the in the elastic moduli, pointing towards a phase transition um, at these two points here. Okay, and there's also um, sort of this diagram is a little uh, dated, but there also more, there's also more recent data, including from USR, um, sort of evidencing something that slow down across T star. Um, away from this T star line, there are all other phase transitions that have been reported, including um, the onset of sort of charge density wave uh, ordering. Uh, marked by this green dome here, and 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 then sort of at sort of systematically depressed from this T star line, there's also been evidence of a polar curry effect onset in YBCO. Okay, so um, you know we want to sort of uh, we want to you know uh, deploy our technique to see whether we could uh, say something um, that contributes to this conversation, um, and so. Uh, basically, we, we deploy the same layout that I'll, uh, I talked about earlier, this RA type scheme. And uh, we looked at, we monitored both the uh, linear and, and SHG channels. And I want to just talk about, um, you know, ideally what those patterns should look like if we, you know, refined our tensors under the reported orthrhombic MMM point group. Okay, so in the linear channel, at least in this sort of S polarization, S polarized in, S polarized out channel. S just means again that the electric field is um, perpendicular to the scattering plane of light. Um, you, in, in the linear channel, you should see sort of this ovular structure, okay, with high symmetry directions along the A and B axis of your thrombic cell. 
and at, um, and then in the second harmonic channel, uh, your pattern should look something like this. Okay, again, reflective of this MMM symmetry. Um, so in fact, that's um, this is not uh, what we see. Okay, so here is data above T star at various doping levels, and you can see that there's already this departure from this MMM type structure. Okay, in both the linear and the non in the SHG channels, and I'm sort of marking here with this red and blue wedge, you know, sort of just how much it's offset from this high symmetry axis. And so as you start to dope towards the end member, um, this it's, looks like it's kind of starts to heal and go back to what you'd expect of MMM, but certainly as you're far away from it, as there's more disorder in the system, it looks like um, there's this departure, okay? And um, the reasons for this are, are currently still not, not very clear. Uh, there could be some subtle crystallographic distortion that, that just simply wasn't resolved uh, with the available diffraction techniques. Um, but I will say that we can refine these types of uh, patterns under a lower symmetry group, uh, namely this monoclinic 2 over M point group. Okay. So this is already present at, at high temperatures above T star. And as we cool below T star, um, then you see that, uh, again, in the linear response, there's there's uh, nothing remarkable happening, but um, there is this uptick in SHG intensity, okay? Reminiscent of some of the data I showed you earlier in other compounds. And you can follow um, it, sort of this onset as a function of doping. Um, and what you find is that this onset temperature is changing in a way that um, sort of nicely falls along the T star line that's been uh, identified by these various previous measurements, okay? And so at least at the time, of, uh, at the time that we uh, published this work, um, you know, there was no evidence of any sort of, um, you know, um, a, a not, you know, um, well, in the neutrons, they had, you know, they had, they had uh, already sort of uh, pointed towards possibility of inversion breaking. And, and, and so our data, you know, the fact that you don't see anything in the linear channel and something pop up quite strikingly in the nonlinear channel really, um, you know, reminded us of that and um, pointed towards, you know, some underlying order that breaks inversion symmetry, okay? Um, and I should, I should, I just want to add that there, there are no anomalies that we could detect at these other um, critical temperatures that were measured in other parts of the phase diagram. So it's only really only what is something happening at T star that lifts the second harmonic intensity. So, you know, the way we had to interpret this data um, is a bit is a, is a bit tricky because um, as you can see, um, here, here I'm comparing the overlaying the patterns both above and below T star on top of each other. Um, below T star, there's a change in intensity, but there's no change in the apparent symmetry of the of the pattern, right? It still looks like this sort of um, two over M type pattern. Now, it's um, you know just by symmetry, one knows that in in this SS channel, um, the second harmonic generation in the electric dipole uh, radiation channel uh, is forbidden if the system contains C2, okay? And so if the symmetry breaking below T star were occurring because uh, of a transition to another uh, order with C2 symmetry, um, then you really shouldn't see any radiation in the SS channel, at least in the electric dipole uh, approximation, okay? And so in order to you know, get around this, this issue, uh, we had to assume that there are C1 symmetric domains, okay, inside your material. If you have C1 symmetry, then you are, you are allowed to have um, SS radiation in the ED channel. And so um, that was how we interpreted the data at that point. Uh, we have uh, these sort of um, domains littered throughout the sample that have C1 symmetry that break inversion, and somehow our beam is just uh, somehow our setup doesn't have the resolution to spatially resolve them cleanly, and we're seeing some uh, domain average of the two, okay? And I should mention um, that um, the types of uh, C1 symmetry that we postulated uh, are consistent with the types of um, order that Chandra has, has predicted 
uh, namely this theta two loop current order. Okay, so it could be, it's consistent with sort of, you know, patches of this different type of loop order that we're spatially averaging over. Um, I do want to mention briefly um, that uh, a, there was a paper that appeared online a few a few days ago um, from the, the from the Capitolnik group at Stanford um, using also a, a second order nonlinear optical technique, this time not second harmonic generation, but rather optical rectification where you have um, you know, two electric fields, but now you have electric field of omega times the electric field minus omega, um, giving rise to a DC response, which you pick up as a as a photo as a DC photo current. Okay, so here instead of p equals chi e, it's really j equals you know chi e star, um, and you can do similar things in this uh, type of measurement that we do, where you do you know rotational anisotropy, for example, and you you start to tease out the structure of the tensor, and at least in, in these um, Bismuth uh, 2201 materials and 2212 they've done as well, um, they also see um, evidence uh, of inversion breaking uh, below T star. Okay, so this, this at least this type of phenomena seems to uh, perhaps be uh, present not just in YBCO. Okay, so now I wanna, um, I wanna uh, finish um, with, uh, by going into some more recent results on copper oxychlorides. And, and this is kind of some mysterious data. Okay, so, um, you know, we were motivated to do, please yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so this uh, experiment at Stanford also saw chirality. Oh, that's right, yes. Uh, in... So it was a chiral point group that, that best fit the data, I think. Sorry? Um, I, I, it was a chiral point group, I think, that best fit the uh, CPGE data. So how would that show up in SSG? Um, we would have to compute it. Um, it's, I don't have intuition off the top of my head, but, uh, you know, yeah, we would have to just take that chiral point group, analyze the tensor structure, and then plot out what these you are. Haven't, right? You haven't done that. You, you we, haven't done that. We have... Um, You know, I think we did that for, we did that for point group two. So, you know, we, we looked at, we also looked at subgroups of the point group that, sorry, we looked at, we looked at various subgroups of the point group that we used, which was two prime over M. I should have mentioned that was the C1 point group we used for our data. Um, and, you know, though I don't remember, uh, you know, I don't remember exactly if we looked at the chiral ones, but I would I would suspect that at least for the data that we acquired, um, those you know there, there's there's a, a large enough number of tensor free parameters that it would probably fit, and we'd have we'd probably have to take uh, you know more extensive data, maybe even on different surfaces, to try to uh, narrow down you know even further. So just based on data we have now, I would guess that uh, you know lower symmetry chiral groups would, would 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 fit, but we wouldn't be able to definitively say one versus another. Okay. Okay. So um, you know we were interested in sort of following this T star line, at least as far as the SHG onset goes, to lower temperature approaching um, the undoped parent phase. Okay. Um, however, um, in, in YBCO, TNAL is quite, is quite high. And so we decided to look at a, a, a different system, which is this system strontium-2 copper uh, chlorine-2 oxygen-2, or SCOC for short. Um, oh, sorry, I flipped. I, I, these should be reversed. Um, it should be O2Cl2, um, SCOC for short. Um, because um, A, these, these are really model insulating cuprates, as I'll show you in a second, in the sense that you know, the, the structure is quite perfect. And also the nail temperatures is, uh, you know, below room temperature. So it's quite manageable in our experiments. So um, structurally, as I mentioned, these things are um, quite ideal. Uh, they're centrosymmetric. They adopt this tetragonal four over MMM point group structure. Okay, so, so here again, four refers to C4 symmetry about the C axis. And the M's are basically three orthogonal mirror planes. Um, M here, MAB, MAB. MAC and MBC, these, these 
three different um, shaded slices uh, that I've shown. And the nice thing about this compound is that, you know, um, A, it turns out to be hard to dope. And so it's, it's, stoic, it's quite stoichiometric. And, and, and two, really, um, you know, um, detailed uh, structural refinements really haven't shown any, any departures, um, neither in the bulk nor on the surface of this compound. Okay, so it's really clean, at least structurally a clean material. Um, the SHG from this material uh, is very weak, as I'll show you in a slide. But um, what we've done is we've managed to pick up uh, an SHG signal nonetheless by um, by leveraging uh, sort of a resonant enhancement process. Okay, and that resonant enhancement process involves um, having a an intermediate state. Okay, and inter uh, uh, so your your instant photon energy is um, re is um, on resonance with a DD transition. Okay, um, and then your second photon for SHG goes goes from here to uh, the charge transfer, um, the gap edge. Okay, and so you have this sort of double resonance that allows us, I think, to pick up the SHG, um, even though generically it's quite weak. Okay. Okay. So just to um, uh, just to hammer that home th that point home a little bit more strongly. Um, 1.5 eb instant photon energy is where we think this uh, resin enhancement is is achieved. So if you look at the data, here's 1.5 eb data at oblique incidence. That's shown in this uh, by this blue curve here. Okay. So as I mentioned, the data is really weak, but it's 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 you know under the same experimental conditions. If we looked at we looked at a Gatling Marstein wafer, and this is about 10,000 times weaker. Um, so it's it's it's. Um, it's a, it's a bit noisy for that reason, but nevertheless, you can pick up a clear, you know, RA type behavior. And uh, if you go just a little bit off resonance, if, you, if we come in with, for example, one EV under the same experimental geometry, we don't see anything. So that's why we think we're riding on this resonance. Uh, and moreover, at least this is temperature taken at 300 Kelvin above TNAL. Um, you can distinguish between whether you're looking at, uh, you know, what type of process you're looking at. Are you looking at an electric dipole process from the surface or an electric quadrupole process from the bulk? And at least in this SS channel, which we like to use, um, uh, we know that the electric dipole process has to be independent of the angle of instance theta. Okay, it has to be angle, independent of this angle. You can, you can sort of reason to yourself, right? The process is P equals chi EE, -E, and that doesn't depend on theta. Okay, and so you would expect that if you're looking at the surface, you would have, um, you would have no theta dependence. Whereas if you're looking at the electric quadrupole channel where there's a gradient, so it takes down, there's a you know factor of the wave vector in it, then you that will depend on angle of incidence. And um, at least in the reported uh, point group for RevMM, that should scale as sine squared theta. So it should vanish at normal incidence. And, and indeed we see that, um, you know, if you, if we've done an angle of incidence dependence measurement that, that vanishes once we go to normal incidence. So we th we're pretty confident that what we're seeing, at least at room temperature, is this sort of resin enhanced bulk SHG process coming from the bulk electro quadrupole radiation channel. Okay, so that's what's give rise to these these wiggles here. Okay, uh, now onto the onto the magnetic stuff. So um, again, this is a this is something that's been well documented in the literature below roughly 260 Kelvin. Uh, there's a there's a transition from paramagnet to antiferromagnet, and the antiferromagnetic uh, structure is uh, um, you know quite well uh, characterized, right? So it's um, you, it's this two sublattice nail order with the spins uh, pointing along uh, next nearest neighbor copper atoms, okay, like this. Um, this nail structure uh, is again centrosymmetric; it doesn't break inversion symmetry. And the magnetic point group that it respects is this MMM1 prime structure. Okay, um, as I'll show you uh, here, you know um, these. There's still you know all all three of these mirror planes. Now MXZ, MYZ, MXZ are um, preserved under uh, this antiferromagnetic structure, um, and one prime just means that um, under time it's also invariant under time reversal. So if you reverse, you can see here if I reverse all the red arrows. I just I, I just have to do a um, you know uh, I just have to shift along the uh, nearest neighbor direction by one units you know 
by, by um, one lattice constant and I get back my, I get back the system, right? So it's, in that sense, it's time reversal invariant. Um, so I would say time reversal, you know, it's time reversal modulo translation gets you back to the original system. Okay, so um, given this symmetry, what, uh, what would you expect? Well, first of all, let me focus on the high temperature data just for a second. So here, here's data at 320 Kelvin, well above TNAL, and um, the RA patterns in the various channels look like this. And these um, actually agree very well with uh, the reported four over MMM structure, okay? With radiation coming in the EQ channel, okay? Um, and as you can see, just in, even from the data alone without having to fit, you know, all these mirror planes that are uh, supposed to be there are there in the data, okay? Now, as I mentioned, as you cool down below TNAL, um, you preserve um, the MY, uh, excuse me, the MYZ, MXZ, and MXY mirrors, okay? But you break the mirrors along, um, you know, the, the AC and BC planes that were there in the crystallographic structure. So you should break you should break here AC, BC, but preserve XZ, YZ, okay? Um, in the PP and SP channels, we really don't see, um, we see a change in our intensity, but not really in the symmetries. But um, strangely, we do see symmetry breaking in the SS and PS channels, uh, but it breaks in a way that violates what one might expect from the nail order, okay? So here, again, the data is a bit weak, um, but I hope you can make out that um, what seems to be going on is what used to be, you know, four equal pedals here has, um, you know, acquired this alternating amplitude. You have small pedal, big, small, big pedal, small, big, small, big, and so on and so on in both the SS and PS channels. Okay. And here you can see that, yes, I've broken my um, AC and BC mirror planes as I expect from the nail order, but I also break the XC and YZ mirrors, which you don't expect from the nail order. The nail order... Um, should preserve this mirror and it should preserve this horizontal mirror as well. Okay, so somehow below TNAL, even in the data, uh, even in the raw data, one sees that all of the vertical mirror planes have been broken. And that's not what you'd uh, expect from the nail structure. Okay. Okay. Um, what's, what's also peculiar is that if you look at the um, S output channel. So if I look at SS or PS, okay, um, then I do see this a feature at TNAL, roughly, um, where you know the SHG turns on, okay, uh, maybe in an order parameter like fashion. Uh, and there's you know there's no thermal hysteresis that we've um, that we're, we were able to resolve, okay, consistent with some continuous transition. But in the P output channels in SP and PP, um, we don't see any features at TNAL. And that's consistent with uh, you know, the fact that we don't see any clear symmetry breaking in the PP or SP channels, just in the SS and PS channels, okay? There's a little bit of a slope on, the, on these uh, SP and PP uh, uh, temperature dependencies that we, we now think, you know, we, we think come from just thermal, th uh, thermal contraction effects. Uh, and uh, we have a paper on the archive explaining that. Okay, so, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, it, it was at, at, at the beginning an experimental mystery as to why we only see it in this, these S out channels, not in the P out channels. And moreover, I should mention, we, we did angle and instance dependence measurements um, also below TNAL, and we see that the same, we, we found that the intensity vanishes at normal instance. Um, and so we know that this, you know, this extra piece that emerges below TNAL is not coming from the electric dipole channel. So it doesn't break inversion below TNAL. Okay. Um, so first let me talk about how one might just phenomenologically fit this data. At high temperatures, you have, um, again, an electric quadrupole I-type tensor respecting four over MMM tetragonal symmetry. And in the SS channel, that gives rise to a pattern that looks like this, okay. Um, and if you fit that just to an isotropic response, okay, some tensor that does not depend on phi, um, then if you coherently add these, okay, then you get a pattern that actually fits our data quite well. 
this gives rise to sort of this big, small lobe amplitude alternation. Okay. Well, and that's just because the optical phase is alternating in this, uh, in this pattern here. The optical phase is going plus minus plus minus. We're measuring the intensity so it's squared. So it looks to be of the same amplitude. But when you interfere that with another term, um, these phases then have constructive destructive alternating interferences giving rise to this big small pattern. Okay. And so the, the most simple way you can fit the data is just say, well, there's some isotropic term that turns on uh, below TNAL, um, somehow only in the S out channels. And that constructive interference then generates uh, our, our data. Okay. And so we call that, um, we'll, we'll call that order parameter phi. Okay. And we'll, uh, uh, plus phi will be, um, you know, the, you want one of the, the two time verse partners of, of that order. Okay. Um, if you were to have minus phi, for example, then it would be instead of big, small, big, small, it would be small, big, small, big. Okay. okay so what what do we you know what do we know about uh, our observations? We know that um, this order parameter phi, whatever it is, detected by SHG, it breaks all the mi vertical mirror planes. Okay. Uh, it does not break inversion since we see it the, the the signal go away in the SS channel at normal incidence. There's no contribution in the P out channels. And um, the contribution in the S out channels is isotropic, something like that. Okay, so uh, we then went around and looked for what uh, in the world might satisfy all these uh, conditions. And the simplest um, interpretation of why all the vertical mirrors are broken might just be that uh, it's, it's broken structurally. So instead of four over MMM, it's four over, it goes to four over M. The in-plane mirrors are, are gone. Um, and that's, um, you know, that can arise, uh, for example, if you had, um, you know, let's say if your, if your oxygen octahedra had uh, actually formed a two sublattice structure uh, with different apical oxygen distances on neighboring octahedra, one, one example. Um, however, um, you know, there's, A, there's no evidence of this, at least from the, ex from the existing literature on uh, X-ray neutron diffraction. Uh, and moreover, um, it's sort of not intuitive why, uh, you know, the system transitioning from a tetragonal to an orthrhombic uh, magnetic structure would distort the crystal in this tetragonal way as a secondary order parameter. Okay. Um, you can posit that maybe there's some, you know, surface reconstruction, uh, but again, surface sensitive techniques, helium scattering, ARPES, lead, um, have not reported evidence of any surface reconstruction. And moreover, if it were only a surface reconstruction, you'd expect that we would pick that up through a surface electric dipole channel. Um, but as I mentioned, it's not uh, the fact that our angle of instance shows it vanishes at normal instance tells us that it's not um, surface electric dipole radiation. So these sort of this more this more maybe simple picture of having just structural deformation lead to the loss of vertical mirrors. Uh, is something that we rule out. Um, you know, the next interpretation is that it's some magnetic order that breaks these vertical mirrors. Okay, and so the simplest magnetic point group we can consider is four over m prime, four over m m prime m prime, where the these vertical mirrors correspond to these last two m's are broken by virtue of some magnetic order. So the prime is just time reversal. Okay. So, so M doesn't, M is not a symmetry, M prime is a symmetry. Now, um, when, you, uh, when you go from four over M, M, M to four over M, M prime, M prime, okay, um, you have uh, some magnetic order that um, uh, transforms like the A2G rep of the high temperature point group. And this, and, and this, trans, this transforms like um, a Z component of magnetization, okay? So if you had ferromagnetism, um, that would satisfy um, this magnetic point group, for example. And it turns out, so we, we look, we combed through, um, you know, the, the sort of, we all the, you know, we did all the calculation, tensor calculations um, for various processes respecting this point group. And what we found is that for magnetic dipole C-type 
radiation, uh, you know, governed by this equation where P equals chi MD C type E H, okay? Um, under this point group, the response looks like this. In the P out channels, the response is forbidden. And in the S out channels, it's isotropic. So it's, that's exactly what we see in the experiments. Um, and so the next, you know, now that we understand, uh, you know, what process is generating uh, the observation, um, sort of our last step was to ask, you know, well, why would, why would the system have this 4M M prime M prime symmetry? Okay, that's different from the reported nail structure. Well, as I mentioned, one possibility is just ferromagnetism. That would do it. Um, so how, how would you get it? Well, you know, you could, for example, um, if there's some if there's some spin canting along the z-axis, you would have a net ferromagnetic moment. Uh, that could that could explain things, um, but uh, again, you know, there th this crystal is uh, this this material is crystallographically quite perfect. There's no there are no known distortions that would lead to any uh, jelasinski maria interactions that would cause such canting. Uh, and moreover, um, you know, there there's been some X-ray magnetic circular dichroism experiments that have been um, performed on this compound in comparison to other compounds like LCO or YBCO where there's known canting and there's no detectable spin canting in SCOC, again, consistent with the lack of DM interaction, okay? So here you can see in LCO, the, the canting is, you know, I think just a few degrees, two or three degrees, uh, they pick up as this red curve, whereas SCOC is really zero, okay? At least within their within their uh, measurement noise. So we don't think it's this, we don't think it's spin canting. Um, uh, and, and again, I should add here that if it were spin canting at the surface only, you would, you would expect to see some C-type surface electric dipole radiation. Uh, but again, we, you know, our radiation source is not electric dipole in origin. Um, the other possibility is, is again, you go to, you go to higher multiples. So instead of ferrodipolar, maybe or excuse me, uh, you go to, um, instead of uh, spin canting, maybe it's some, some other type of ferrodipolar order. Um, and one possibility is um, sort of an orbital current um, type picture, right? Um, so, you know, building on some of, um, you know, the, the loop current models um, that I talked about with regards to Chandra's old work uh, uh, previously in, um, in the context of YBCO, uh, you can construct uh, orbital currents that preserve inversion, okay? Um, and so that could be, uh, um, yeah, that's a possible uh, solution to our to our problem. And I just wanted to mention that, you know, this four over M, M prime and prime point group actually uh, allows for an anomalous thermal Hall effect. So perhaps there are measurements to some of the measure, um, data that you heard uh, recently from, from the Typher group. Um, alternatively, we, you can also turn to non-dipolar ferro orders. So maybe it's some ferro octopolar order, for example. Um, the quadrupole order we rule out just because that would break inversion. So you want to go to the next highest pole, which is octopolar. Um, and so, you know, a decoration of the lattice with octopoles like this would also give you the right point group structure that explains our SHG data. And, um, you know, we would invite uh, further studies with perhaps resonant x-ray scattering or nonlinear uh, magnetization techniques to, to, to check whether maybe these types of orders exist. David, okay. if I can interrupt you for just one second. Yeah, um, please. Go back to the previous slide. Just to get the estimate, suppose just for sake of the word that spin canting, do you have an estimate what the size of the angle, what the size of the canting would be? Um, what would be the canting angle? Yeah, so I can, I can go backwards, which is to say that if we take LCO as canting by, um, let's say three degrees, um, their their noise floor, I think, is a from this paper, I believe, was a tenth of that. So that's 0.3 degrees. So that's nothing within 0.3 degrees. And okay. So it would have to be something smaller than that. Thank you. Thanks. I have a question too. Yeah, please. Uh, this is Anton. Um, so you say there's no DM interactions. Why is that? Just oh, uh, just because the uh, if I just go back to the to the crystallographic structure, just because these are you know these are perfectly straight bonds. 
These okay. copper oxygen, uh, oxygen copper oxygen bonds are linear. Okay, just by symmetry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and and so I want to say one more sort of interesting, albeit uh, perplexing, aspect of the data, which is. Um, so I mentioned that you know you can get these patterns by interfering this plus phi this this isotropic term right um, and so and you would expect okay if you have some you know uh, if you have some magnetic order you would have both time reverse domains you know, plus phi minus phi and the plus phi would give you big small big small amplitude and the minus phi would give you small big small big so you, generically we expected to find both but um, we did two things. We did spatial scanning measurements to try to look for these partners, these time reverse partners. Um, and here I'm showing you data from a sample that we, we did it on a few samples, but this is a sample that's particularly terraced, just so we try to look for different heights, uh, maybe, you know, maybe at, at different uh, depths that, that you know, we, we would have luck finding the minus phi domain. Uh, but the answer is no, we, we could never find the, um, the minus phi partner. Here I'm just showing you um, what these colors mean is it's the ratio of the amplitude of adjacent lobes. Okay, so um, if it's greater than one, it's big, small. If it's smaller than one, it's small, big. Um, and you can see that everywhere we scan, uh, it's it's red. So it's always, you know, it's always just plus phi. And um, we've also tried to thermally cycle across uh, TNAL uh, by uh, sitting on the same spot. Here's one one example of such a cycle. And you can see that uh, it always just, the, the, big, the ones that go big are the, are the ones that always go big as you go below TNL and you never see these two reversed. Okay, so thermal cycling doesn't seem to switch the sign of phi. Um, so um, sort of that leaves us with a bit of an open question, which is sort of the nature of phi. Um, one possibility is that, um, you know, it's something independent of the nail order altogether but somehow it onsets at T-nail. Um, or um, perhaps um, I should mention with regards to the first point, it maybe it, you know, there's, some, there's some coupling to, to the nail order and um, that enables it for whatever reason to become visible in SHG. Um, and the second possibility is that um, it doesn't onset at nail, but it onsets already far above nail. So it's already baked into the material um, with one sign, and that's why thermal cycling above TNAL doesn't uh, doesn't change its sign. We, maybe we have to cycle to much higher temperatures. Um, we don't know. Okay, but I will. Okay, so that 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 is an open question. Um, but I will try to wrap up with some um, interesting, uh, albeit you know, maybe speculative um, thoughts. Um, one of which is you know this this vertical symmetry breaking that we observe in SCOC um, is not new in the sense that, you know, our old YBCO data also showed this, this loss of vertical mirror symmetry, at least compared to the published uh, structure um, that was refined from diffraction. Um, and in Terra's polarimetry, they had also shown um, that this uh, vertical mirror symmetry breaking gets enhanced below T star. Okay. Um, and that, has been extended uh, more recently um, to, you know, um, all the way up to, to the mid-infrared and even the visible range of, um, of optical detection. Okay, so, you know, this vertical mirror symmetry loss that we see in the parent, could that be related to um, pseudogap physics? Well, you know, there, there are some similarities, that's all I can say. Um, the polar curry effect uh, that was reported um, back in 2008 on, on YBCO also shows interesting, this interesting phenomenon where um, you can field train the sign of the signal um, far above T star. Okay, so if you go far above T star and you slap on either a, uh, you know, up or down oriented uh, magnetic field of order four Tesla, you can actually switch the sign of the Kerr trace. And so that sort of points towards some ordering uh, already uh, sort of um, set in far above T star, which is a bit reminiscent of what, uh, you know, we see as far as the inability to flip our domain, even thermally cycling above T nail in SCOC. Um, and then, um, you know, 
the fact that we see something that uh, suggests sort of some pharaoh type order, again, is reminiscent of what um, uh, the polarized neutron diffraction results reported vis-a-vis uh, -vis Q equals zero magnetism below T star. So I think that there, there are interesting, um, maybe thought-provoking connections to what other groups have observed in the pseudo gap uh, with regards to um, what we see in the parent compound in the undoped SCOC compound. Um, but these, these, these remain speculative at this point. Okay, so perfect. We're exactly at nine o'clock or at 12 o'clock your time. Um, I wanna just end again by, um, you know, expressing a first thanks to, for your extended attention uh, and especially to all, all the collaborators on these projects, um, you know, who, who made it both fun and possible. Okay, so thanks. I'm happy to stick around for questions. Uh, thanks, David, for a very nice talk. Uh, any questions? Okay, yeah, let me shut. Um, can you hear me? Uh, is this is this Ivan? Yes, Ivan. Yeah, hi, Ivan. Uh, two two quick questions. The first one, which you must have been asked uh, uh, a lot, is about energy. Uh, the T star is like uh, 300 Kelvin down to zero. That means uh, 25 MeV down to zero. You're pumping at 1.5 and probing at 3 EV. Is uh, that a concern? Would you expect that uh, terahertz uh, second harmonic generation would give uh, additional information? Yeah, I think I think it definitely would. And you know, repeating, um, re re you know, per potentially repeating some of this. Um, you know, terahertz polarimetry, uh, ex both both linear. You know, this is you know, linear terahertz polarimetry measurements, and uh, on these uh, SCOC compounds would be would be very valuable. It's a little bit tough because um, you know terahertz uh, studies require big samples. I right. believe these are done in thin films, whereas the, um, as far as I know, the SCOC is just in uh, bulk single crystal form. Um, right. But um, uh, um, yeah, we have uh, we we can potentially do that in our in our group, on, on you know, a few millimeter sized crystals, um, and also um, yeah, I think going you know terahertz SHG would be wonderful. It's it's uh, technically it's technically very challenging, um, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's something that I think would would definitely reveal a lot of information. I just don't know how to do it at this point. Okay, the second um, uh, quick question. Uh, is about um, about the surface orientation with respect to crystallographic planes. Uh, this is an issue both for thin films and for cleaved crystals uh, or polished crystals. Um, how sensitive you are to uh, a little um, misalignment between the polished surface or uh, thin film surface and the crystallographic plane, let's say half a degree or, or 0.1 degree. Would that would that uh, be affecting the measurement? Um, so the, the um, I'll answer that in a few parts. One of one of which is you know we we we, we do check the uh, um, we do check the orientation of our surfaces, but that's you know uh, with X rays uh, against it's within a degree or so. Um, uh, but as far as how as far as alignment, we, we, it's really a self-consistency check. So, you know, we, um, we align our, our, our crystals uh, in, in such a way so that this, this is on cleaved COC, but uh, the alignment is such that at high temperatures, it looks very consistent with, uh, you know, the, the, what it should look like. And so that makes us, that, that makes us trust the low temperature results. Um, because uh, you know, um, you know, there there are ways in, in the in the lab we can make sure that you know upon cooling you do have some contraction, but our our contraction doesn't doesn't lead to tilt. It just leads to actually motion along the z-axis of our cryostat along the scattering uh, along along the um, along the rotation axis of the scattering plane. Um, well, it, you know, the, it, how how sensitive would we be um, if if in principle there is some tilt? Uh, I remember, well, we, sorry, go, go ahead. I think for the, you know, I wouldn't worry for the bulk response, but um, uh, if, we, if we grow thin film, you know, we grow 
on uh, real realistic substrates and they are polished with some error. And I think uh, half a degree is not uncommon and the best you can get is let's say 0.1 degree off. So it means that the film is actually um, uh, also visible, it tilted a little. Uh, the copper oxygen planes are not strictly parallel to the surface. They are tilted by let's say half a degree. And um, if you're probing the bulk, that may not be an issue, but the surface uh, uh, response will have C for symmetry broken by, by this tilt. Yeah. So um, we, we, we haven't done the modeling for the cuprates or for mm -hmm. SCOC, but uh, we did some for iridate. And um, our, our conclusion, if I'm remembering correctly, was you know, within a few degrees, uh, let's say, I think, you know, roughly five, let's say within five degrees um, of tilt, um, the, uh, you know, we, we um, was it five? Uh, don't, don't quote me on the five, but within, within, a f within you know, several degrees, the, the error would, would be within the uh, noise of our measurement. So for example, if you look at, if you stay, stay on this, pad, this panel here, right? Like you can see, for example, maybe this, or maybe this one, you know, this lobe is not exactly the same as that lobe. That comes from some, some, some just systematic errors in, in our in our measurement scheme. Um, something like that would overwhelm um, any miscut in, in crystal surface by a few degrees. I, I forget exactly how many, but yeah, more than a, more than one degree. Does that answer your question? Well, let's. I think we can discuss this uh, uh, in offline in, 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 in more detail. Um, it's um, one thing is the tilt of the, of the plane, but the other, other one is that your uh, copper oxygen plane, let's say that is at the surface, imagine it's right at the surface, then it will actually be broken uh, in one direction, in the tilt, tilt direction. Uh, and you'll have, even in transport, you will have some hopping in that direction. Uh, but okay, I think it's maybe too detailed a question. Okay, I'm no, I'm happy to continue uh, offline. I think it's it's it's, uh, it's an interesting thought. I have maybe maybe you're saying something I haven't thought about. May I ask another uh, raise raise another question, David? Uh, of course. And perhaps again, we should uh, perhaps. Uh, the technical perhaps discuss it separately. Um, many of the uh, fascinating issues that you raised in relation to reproducibility of the data when you come down and heat up and come down and sample in terms of uh, the orientations and uh, I encountered the same thing in the Stanford data. Uh, this coupled with the fact that if you have orbital currents, you cannot make domains arbitrarily. If you, if you, the, the domains will always have currents at the boundaries, and the currents cannot uh, uh, be, uh, the currents have to be closed, which imposes uh, some long range order in the domains. Yeah. And uh, and uh, that calls for some kind of some kind of angular symmetry preserved in supercells. And I talked about this a bit uh, a few weeks ago when I gave my talk here. Uh, and I think that's kind of very important to to get things which will not come from simply some order within a cell or with two cells or four cells with all this phenomena of Fermi arcs and small Fermi surface magneto oscillations. So, so, what, so what I'm suggesting is that uh, uh, you have to look at symmetries of, uh, of the, of the super patterns super. that you are speaking about arranged in supercells with giving you additional lowered symmetries hmm. for experiments which are macroscopic like yours is, which is over a very long wavelength. 
Yeah, Ch Chandra, I, be I believe you were on this. Uh, you were on the, the the paper with the photo current. Um, do you? Yeah, I, I I I thought a lot about these issues in relation to. That. Was there maybe, maybe uh, you know apologies if I didn't read it carefully enough, but were there also issues um, with regards to you know um, thermal cycling and not having seeing a sign change? Yes. Yes, I see. Okay. Interesting. Thanks. So we should discuss this uh, yeah. uh, at, at length sometime. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Lovely talk. Thanks. Any other question? Okay, if there is no further question, let's thank uh, David again. David, thanks. Okay, thanks everybody. Yeah, Hui and thanks. Juven, thanks a lot. Thank you, yeah, David, thanks. very much. Great talk. <laughs>